What is wrong with The Sims 4? <whistles> the Sims 2 and 3? The Sims 4. Sims 1. The struggle is real. Sims 2. All the details. Sims 3. Creativity abound. Sims 4. Dress up simulator. Gameplay. The Sims 4. The Sims 2 and 3. This one's my favorite one. <laughs> The Sims 4, building simulator with wasted potential. It's no secret that The Sims 4 feels different to say the least. So today I'm going to explore if this widespread disdain for The Sims 4 is simply a bandwagon a lot of people in the community wanna hop on, or is there truly something fundamentally wrong with this game? Hi, my name is Mara, and this channel is all about embracing the fullness of black womanhood through gaming, creativity, and conversation. But before we get to talking about The Sims 4, we first need to hop in our time machine and understand what The Sims is. Why was this game originally created? The Sims as we know it today was created by a man named Will Wright. Will was always really interested in robotics, computers, architecture, all those sort of technical things. Will Wright and his friend Jeff Brom started the game developing company known as Maxis in 1987 after they both were having trouble finding a publisher for simulation games that they both wanted to produce. The game Will was working on was called SimCity and he was inspired to create it after he found out that he had more fun building islands in his first ever game, which was called Raid on Bungling Bay. The original SimCity was released in 1989 and it became super popular. It sold like a million copies by late 1992. So from here on, Max has dedicated itself to developing a variety of simulation games. Many other Sim titles were released over the course of the 90s, some of which being Sim Earth, Sim Ant, and even Sim Copter, which is the first game to ever feature the Simlish language. At some point in this period, Will Wright had the idea to create an architectural design simulator. As I said before, he's always been interested in architecture since he was a kid. And this game would eventually become The Sims. The idea came about after Will had actually lost his home in a house fire, which is a little bit ironic that The Sims started from a house fire. <laughs> Will wanted to understand like why people bought things and how their objects, their physical objects, affected their behaviors and their environment. But the higher ups at Maxis didn't really see the vision that Will had for this game, so they ended up benching the project. SimCity 2000 came out in 1993 and like its predecessor became extremely popular. It sold like 4.23 million copies worldwide. So obviously Will had sort of a talent for making these simulation games and they were selling. People liked the type of games that Will Wright was creating. Electronic Arts gained ownership of Maxis in 1997, and with these newly acquired funds, the architectural design game that Will had been wanting to make got picked back up again and began to be further developed. So in February 2000, Maxis graced us with The Sims, or what I'll be referring to for clarity's sake as The Sims 1. It was important that this architecture game turned life simulator featured controllable characters because as Will Wright states in this Retro Gamer interview, it was still fun designing houses for The Sims, but controlling their lives actually turned out to be far more compelling. I kept the architecture tools in there, but then I just really started focusing more on the people and objects and their behaviors and relationships. So Will Wright created The Sims not only out of a love for building and architecture, but out of a curiosity for human incentive and behavior, particularly as it relates to their homes, their relationships, and their life decisions. Now that we know this, let's take a look at how life simulation was done in the early Sim games. So I know like a lot of Simmers have an origin story where they're like, I've been playing The Sims since I was born, or I've been playing The Sims since I was five years old. That's not my story. <laughs> my first game was The Sims 3. Um, so I'm going to be referring various interviews, articles, and videos from the research that I've done to break this down for you. Mm -hmm. 
Determining a sim's behavior in The Sims 1 would all begin in Create a Sim. In this astounding Comic Sans menu, The Sims 1 introduced the personality point system, which would later return in The Sims 2 and be replaced by traits in both The Sims 3 and The Sims 4. In The Sims 1, you could assign personality points to the following characteristics. Neat, outgoing, active, playful, and nice. The game would automatically give your sim a astrological sign based on the personality points you assign to each of the characteristics. In this Andrew Arcade video, he sort of explains how the personality points affect your sims in game. Depending on how many points you put in each category determines what trait that person gets in that category. So for example, if we only put zero through two traits or points, sorry, in the neat category, then they'll become a slob and that basically means that they rarely clean up after themselves and they never flush the toilet and they're pretty gross sims. And that's basically the bulk of personalities in The Sims 1. <laughs> but something interesting is that The Sims 1 had an element of mystery where you technically did can make your sims and create their personality, but there was still a sense of mystery in the game where every time you turned it on, you weren't exactly sure what was gonna happen or how your sims would react to everything. When you turn it on, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, every time we play it, it's kind of a surprise. The game itself has been a surprise, with sales over a hundred million dollars, as much as a hit movie. But with The Sims, you create the plot and characters. Give them jobs, families, problems, and let them live. That was personality in The Sims 1. Pretty basic. The Sims 2 did personality points in a pretty similar way. In this Pleasant Sims clip, uh, you can see how she explains sort of how the personalities affect your Sims in game and what each of them do to your Sims. A Sim with really low nice points, like three or under, will be a real jerk and they will start fights with Sims in your neighborhood. Lazy Sims will be lazy, active Sims will be active, and a Sim that has really high neat points, like seven or higher, will be a neat freak constantly cleaning cleaning, can't stand messes, but if they're somewhere in the middle, they don't really have an associated behavior. Pretty similar to how The Sims 1 personality points worked. The Sims 2 also introduced aspirations. However, in the base game, there were only five. Family, romance, knowledge, fortune, and popularity. Your Sims' wants and fears would be controlled by this aspiration system. Aspirations help to further define your Sims' personality and give them goals to work towards in their life. For example, family Sims would often want to get married and have babies. Romance Sims would want to woohoo and go on dates. Knowledge Sims would want to learn new skills and meet aliens. Fortune Sims would want to get Get raises and promotions and earn money. And popularity sims would want to make new friends and throw parties. Seeing a romance sim want to woohoo with three different sims and have a fear of being rejected for a flirt meant you knew exactly what this sim wanted out of life and you knew how to help them get it. So as you can see from that clip, your sim's personalities aspirations, wants, and fears really controlled your Sims behavior in game. Secondary aspirations were introduced with the Sims 2 free time expansion, which allowed you to choose any second base game aspiration to also control your Sims wants and fears. I hope y'all are still with me. This expansion also introduced the grilled cheese aspiration, which would later become a theme in other future sim titles. <laughs> turn on and turn offs were introduced with the Sims 2 nightlife expansion. So if you wanted to add some tea to your game, you could have your sim like be attracted to like elders or like sims with gray hair that have beards. Or you could have your sim be attracted to like fit sims wearing their bathing suit. Maybe they could not be attracted to sims with a lot of makeup. There's a lot of different combinations that you can create using this chemistry system. And it was a fun extra layer to your sims personality, especially as it came to the dating scene. Interest were a thing in The Sims 2. Um, your sim would just be randomly assigned interests when a sim was either created or born, and your interests basically determine how engaged a sim is in conversation when that interest is brought up. And it also like determines what kind of conversations your sim will autonomously initiate. Your sims can gain new interests by reading magazines. And again, it's just like another fun little thing to add to your sims personality and characteristics and behaviors in the game. Hobbies were introduced in the Sims 2 free time expansion, which I think of like a more detailed version of the base game interests. Your sim could gain hobby enthusiasm points in any of the following activities. Cuisine, film and literature, tinkering, sports, music and dance, fitness, arts and crafts, 
science, games, and nature. Certain interests and even personality points would correspond to which hobbies your sim would be more likely drawn to. And by doing certain activities that correspond to said hobby, your sim will naturally and gradually gain hobby enthusiasm points in these different activities. So here's an example of activities that get up your arts and crafts hobby enthusiasm points. Gaining interest in hobbies can start as young as toddlers, which I think is really cool. Definitely a very lifelike addition. Sims also have predestined hobbies, which I think is really cool and also kind of adds to the mystery of The Sims. If you remember, I was talking about that with The Sims 1. Predestined hobbies will be outlined in silver. And I guess you can think of this feature as like a natural born skill or like a activity that just comes naturally to your Sims. You created your Sim, but there's still little quirks about them that you didn't necessarily create. But also add to your storytelling in the game. The Sims 2 introduced memories, which had a huge impact on storytelling and your Sims place in their world. A lot of people in the community talk about the memory system and how iconic it was in The Sims 2. We're not even playing the game. We're just reading the memories and I'm really just learning a lot. Like the plot is thickening just by reading the memories, bro. And basically how it works is that your Sim would acquire positive or negative memories based on different life experiences or interactions or even relationships. The townie sims that like came with the sims 2 would already have like a list of memories as soon as you open the game so that you could see the townies backstories and how they got to the place they were. The memories were integral to the life simulation experience in the sims 2 because your sims future behaviors would be impacted by their past memories of those behaviors, incidents, interactions, or events. Here's another example from Pleasant Sims who breaks down how cheating works in the sims 2. If a sim is cheated on in the sims 2, they will continue to be angry for days, periodically thinking about the offending sim who upset them, seething, and you'll see a thought bubble above their head with flames on it, thinking about how angry they are at the person for hurting them. These kind of memories stuck with the sim and impacted their lives. I also want to mention that the memories weren't all perfect in the sims 2, although this feature added like so much more depth to the game. Throughout my research, I've learned that deleting memories or sims or gravestones can really corrupt your game because in The Sims 2, all of the characters and stories are really connected through the memory system. There have since been resources guiding you through how to delete memories or Sims in The Sims 2, which ones to and to not delete to avoid this type of corruption in your game. But this is something that can affect your gameplay, so I thought I would just mention it. This feature kind of takes away a little bit of your own personal customization in that way, because the town is kind of set up to have its own set stories. Of course, you can you know download your own custom worlds, make your own sims, etc. But the towny stories kind of stay the same around you. You're kind of stuck to the towny stories that the game gives you. All of these features I covered, the personality points, the aspirations, primary and secondary aspirations, turn on and turn offs, interests and memories, all really contributed to the beloved storytelling and lore of The Sims 2. I think we hear those words a lot, especially as it relates to The Sims, like storytelling and lore. So why are those two things so important to this game? First, I wanna start off by defining lore because I personally didn't know what this meant until I started seeing the term be used more and more. So lore derives from the word folklore, and it's basically like a set of traditions, facts, or beliefs that belong to a particular group. So as it relates to The Sims, the lore of The Sims would be things like the classic townies that have made an appearance in every generation of the game, like Don Lothario and the Goths and the Dreamers, the Calientes, the Landgrabs. Also reoccurring Easter eggs like The Sims' obsession with llamas and gnomes and grilled cheese. That would also be considered like part of the lore of The Sims franchise. Okay, but back to my question, why are storytelling and lore so important to this game? Well, according to Psychology Today, Storytelling has a unique ability to build deep, meaningful connections. That's kind of how we as humans are wired to work. When you think about it, we are almost always consuming or telling ourselves stories. And I'm not just talking about in movies or in books. 
When you catch up with a friend you haven't seen in a while, you're probably going to exchange stories of what y'all have been up to since the last time you've been together. In a school or a classroom setting, it's not uncommon for teachers to give examples using a story to help ingrain whatever information it is that you're learning into your head. This entire video you're watching has basically been accumulation of stories. I started off with telling you the history of The Sims and Will Wright. And when you go to sleep, the storytelling doesn't stop there. Your brain continues to try to make sense of the world and your subconscious by telling you stories through your dreams. So storytelling is a huge way that we connect as people and process loads of information. It may sound like I'm going a bit off topic here, but I say all that to say, Will Wright understood that people are fascinated with people. So even if people at Max's didn't necessarily see his vision at first, using this premise, he and his team went out to create a game based on just that giving life to the human experience through a video game in a way that's kooky and unexpected, but still feels very real, fun, and personal. Will Wright has sold 15 million games that have no monsters, no shootouts, not even winners and losers. He's made games out of making life work. Developing town lore with set storylines, distinct personalities, and the elaborate memory system not only helped like walk the player through how to play the game, but it also got the player to build a relationship with these townies and like a lot of simmers truly fall in love with them. Pleasant View is the most drama filled, saddest, train wreck, hot mess world that you will ever experience in your Sims 2 life. We loved and cared about these Sims and wanted to tell their stories through our gameplay. The lore was a lot of the reason a lot of players got hooked on this game franchise. In this 2004 interview with GameSpy, Will Wright states that ever since we started testing the first version of The Sims, we noticed that people couldn't play without attaching a story to what they were seeing. This seems to be a natural way in which humans understand, remember, and communicate experiences. Over time, we've come to recognize that storytelling is integral to the entire Sims idea, and we're always looking for ways to let players create, drive, and share these stories. Okay, so so far we've discussed how life simulation was done in both The Sims 1 and The Sims 2, as well as why storytelling is kind of the whole point of this game. But apart from the human mind's natural attraction to storytelling, there has to be more. Why were these early Sims games so popular? Especially The Sims 2. Was it just the wow factor of never having experienced a game quite like The Sims before? Or was there something truly special about the formula that Will Wright created? On Twitter, Ari says that The Sims 2 had the most depth. There were little animation details that made the game come alive. It was campy and fun and not watered down. It had consequences, the best lore, drama, the chemistry system, the best memory system. And she even makes the point that teenagers were more realistic and she gave the examples that they actually got pimples in The Sims 2. Mojom Mana... I'm sorry, girl, but she says on Twitter, the Sims 2 Sims were truly unique and the game really felt like a life simulation with just the right amount of crazy. I saw so many other tweets about like the Sims 2 also being the most detailed games and with those examples that I gave before, you can see how those little details and those little things that they added to the life simulation experience and into your Sims personality really made The Sims 2 come alive and be sort of the iconic game that it is. From my analysis, the primary goals of these early Sims games was really to create a true life simulation experience where you had some control, but you didn't have all the control. You weren't sure what was gonna happen every time you opened up your game. That was sort of the goal of these early Sims games. And that's kind of just what Will Wright set out to do from the beginning. When you turn it on, you never know what's gonna happen. Um, every time you play it, it's kind of a surprise. In the same 2004 interview with GameSpy, weeks before The Sims 2 was released, Will Wright states that, I think the combination of an approachable subject, everyday life, as well as a well-tested game interface were prerequisites to success. On top of that, the open-ended narrative, rich gameplay, and huge fan involvement, such as fan sites, custom content, The Sims Exchange, etc., really put it over the top. Players have not gotten their hands on The Sims 2 yet, but this is just what Will Wright had said about why he thought The Sims 1 was such a success. 
The Sims 1 and 2 also attracted a whole new demographic of players who society otherwise wouldn't have thought would be interested in gaming. The Sims became a favorite amongst a lot of women and children, who at the time were not often included in any conversations in the gaming industry. In my opinion, The Sims introduced a whole new genre of gaming, which brought about a whole new community of gamers. Players could also use The Sims in a variety of different ways. I kind of break it down into two categories, building and storytelling. But even within storytelling, there were so many different ways you could tell your stories in The Sims 2. Will Wright emphasized that exploring the failure states, recreating your own family, and pursuing the in-game goals were all different ways that we saw people play the game. I've heard some people argue that although The Sims 2 is foundational to kind of how we understand what The Sims is today, it's still limited in some ways. You'll get to see how much more customization players got with future generations of this game compared to The Sims 2. And although there were ways that you could personalize your Sims 2 experience, this game is kind of set up to guide you through how to play. The towny houses, for example, are kind of like tutorials to show you the vast array of things that you can do in The Sims. So The Sims 2 is more structured in that way. There are more things that are beyond your control or more things that were set up kind of before you got there, if that makes sense. And some people like this approach and some people don't. Having this sort of understanding will help us better understand why people are arguing over more recent Sims games and what people actually want to see. But I think it's safe to say that the storytelling, the lore, the flexibility of the game, and the wide demographic of players really set Maxis up with a strong fan base for the next generation of The Sims. Will Wright left Maxis in 2009, however, I'm not sure exactly when he stopped developing for The Sims, but I do know that he was not involved in the development process for The Sims 3, which was released that same year. The Sims 3 is what I like to call the beginning of a new era for The Sims franchise. It introduced a whole new generation of players like myself who got hooked on the game, but as to be expected, The Sims 3 took away and added on a lot of features from The Sims 2, which again, depending on your playstyle, style and your preferences could be a good thing or a bad thing. The Sims 3 versus The Sims 4 seems to be a hot topic. A lot of people like to argue about over on Twitter. And this debate has honestly been going on for a long time. If y'all remember, like not that long ago, if you said you didn't like The Sims 4, people would like attack you. <laughs> and now it seems like the roles have switched. Some of y'all don't know about that, but that was not too long ago. Do not forget <laughs> people was being dragged for not playing The Sims 4. But are people just hung up on nostalgia or is The Sims 3 truly the superior gem that many consider it to be? So what was the evolution from The Sims 2 to The Sims 3? The Sims 3 kept a bit of The Sims 2 lore by bringing back some familiar faces and creating some new townies. But more than anything, The Sims 3 placed a heavy emphasis on user customization and the player's ability to create their own stories within their own world. The Sims 3 took a whole new approach to personalities by introducing traits. A total of 64 traits came with The Sims 3 base game, 35 were added over the course of expansion packs, giving us a total of 99 traits in The Sims 3 game with all of the packs installed. Certain traits also serve as conversation topics, and there are a ton of new like unique interactions that Sims with those traits can only do. For example, with the bookworm trait, Sims can talk about books, they can praise a good book they've read recently, they can join a book club, bookworms can read faster than other Sims, they have more fun reading than other Sims, your Sims can write higher quality novels. Teenagers and children can finish their homework faster. NPCs with the bookworm trait are tend to be attracted to the library and the bookstore. And bookworms prefer watching the History Channel on TV. Traits really affected your Sims like experience in the game, not only by giving them you know more conversation topics and things they like to do, but also by having an impact on their desires and wants. And that's only using one trait as an example. So I scrolled back all the way through the Sims YouTube channel and I found the first few trailers for The Sims 3. And you can see here how they put a really heavy emphasis on the different personalities you could create in The Sims 3 using this brand new trait system.
But that's not all for your Sims personality. Although like wants and fears and turn on and turn offs and all that is gone, The Sims 3 expanded on the wants and also revamped aspirations, which are now called lifetime wishes. The Sims 3 had a total of 32 lifetime wishes in the base game. 54 were added over the course of expansion packs, making for a total of 86 lifetime wishes in The Sims 3. The five aspirations that were in The Sims 2 are still technically in The Sims 3. They're just a bit more detailed and can be more individual to specific Sims. For example, instead of having like a general romance aspiration, your sim could want to be a heartbreaker or a gold digger. And in place of having like a general knowledge aspiration, your sim's lifetime wish could be to max out a certain skill or a certain set of skills. For the most part, lifetime wishes are kind of like tutorials to guide you through the different features of The Sims 3, new skills, careers, and even like new expansion pack features. But I do like how they can be more individual and still feel a little bit more personal to specific sims. But speaking of skills, in The Sims 3, your sims can acquire so many specific skills. Instead of just having like a creativity skill like you do in The Sims 2, you have like guitar and painting and writing, which I guess you could also consider as your sims interest because depending on what skills you have, some of them can be used as conversation topics in game. Moodlets were also introduced in this game, which is kind of like the first version of emotions we ever got to see in The Sims. Moodlets were pretty basic in The Sims 3, but still had an impact on your sims lives. Sims would acquire either positive or negative moodlets based on their traits, their surroundings, or recent interactions. I think of the moodlets as a temporary memory system from Sims 2 mixed with how emotions were supposed to work in The Sims 4, but we'll get more into that later. <laughs> if your house is nicely decorated, for example, a Sim could acquire like the nicely decorated moodlet, which will just increase their mood every time they go into their house. But if your house is disgusting, you have like food in the trash, rotting food in the fridge, disgusting toilets and sinks, whatever, your sim could acquire a vile surroundings moodlet as long as they're not a slob, which will just decrease their mood. Negative moodlets weren't the end all be all for your sims, but if your sims mood did get too low, you wouldn't be able to like do little things like make your bed if you're hungry or take a shower if you're too tired. Longer lasting moodlets will have a deeper effect on your sims. These appear for like major life events like marriage, the birth of a child, graduating university, or the death of a loved one. So that's pretty much how moodlets worked in The Sims 3. The Sims 3 also introduced favorites, which didn't really do much, but add a few new conversation topics, but I feel like they were still like a fun feature to have in the game. Sims would get positive moodlets for listening to their favorite music or eating their favorite foods. If your Sims became great friends with someone, they might get a want to learn their favorite food and cook that for them. Their favorite color really didn't do anything, but I personally think it's kind of fun to correspond your Sims outfit to their favorite color or to base their house or their room based on their favorite color. So it's the little things that I feel like add to your Sims personality. But speaking of customization, we have to talk about create a Sim in The Sims 3. Compared to The Sims 2, The Sims 3 create a Sim was like the best we've seen. <laughs> Sims 3 cast was literally iconic. Um, laggy as hell, but still iconic. We are all familiar with our dear friend or nemesis depending on your perspective, the color wheel. The Sims 3 offered so much more customization for your Sims physical appearance and for their houses. The color wheel allowed us to customize the color, print and pattern of everything. So create a style just sort of naturally became another way that we could express our Sims personality. Of course, we cannot talk about The Sims 3 without talking about the open world. The open world takes your Sims out of their own home sanctuary and into a larger experience. Having your Sims being a part of a larger story was an aspect heavily emphasized in the initial marketing for The Sims 3. I think one of the coolest things about The Sims 3 is the fact that my story is part of a bigger story. The neighborhood is growing and changing around me and my characters, and the story that I'm telling is affected by that, and their stories are affected by me. I think the unique thing about having an open world is that in The Sims 2, I would argue that like your Sims may have been like heavily connected through the memory system and through, you know, the lore and the rich storytelling and background. But I feel like in The Sims 3, your Sims got connected through their town. I like how many different towns you can either download or get off The Sims 3 store or that come with expansion packs. They're very diverse and each world has its own vibe and aesthetic and yeah, just feel to it. And especially when you install custom worlds, like you can really find a world for anything that you are looking for in The Sims 3. Another more minor feature of The Sims 3 is autonomy. 
Sims would finally be able to take care of their own needs autonomously in The Sims 3, which makes it great so you don't have to like micromanage all of your Sims all the time. The Sims 3 also removed two needs. So your sim no longer has the room need or the environment need. And The Sims 3 also removed the comfort need. But I feel like those two things, the environment and the comfort, are basically kind of replaced with like moodlets. Although not perfect, I feel like The Sims 3 reflected a lot more of Will Wright's Sims 2 example than not. This focus on the individual sims and the user customization can be seen through create a sim and in game, through the traits, the favorites, the lifetime wishes, the moodlets, as well as through build and buy. The sims were always the main focus, but all the other features just sort of built off of that. And that's basically how life simulation was done in the the Sims 3. The Sims 3 was an extension of what made The Sims 2 so popular. It took an approachable subject, everyday life, and allowed for open-ended narrative with towny backstories, with relationships and connections already set up for you when you loaded up the game. Worlds that felt individual and vast and interconnected. The Sims 3 had rich gameplay with an array of collectibles, skills, wants, moodlets, um, behaviors that made your Sims feel individual, even expansion packs that felt expansive and pretty flexible you know for different types of gameplay of course with a few exceptions <laughs> the sims 3 managed all this while still having huge fan involvement an example of this is how the sims 3 generations came to be I found this tweet from literally AJ who says that Generations was made in direct response to criticism of the lacking family gameplay. And then he goes on in this Twitter thread to explain how The Sims 3 Generations kind of fixed those problems that the community had. And of course, modders, custom content creators, and eventually YouTubers all sort of added to the heavy fan involvement that existed during The Sims 3's prime time. The Sims 3 also supported various play styles. You could be a builder, a stylist, or a storyteller. If you were a more casual player, you could pick up The Sims 3 base game and still have a lot of fun with it. The Sims 3 was still a game on its own without DLC. But if you were a more, you know, addicted player like some of us, um, me. Um, <laughs> the expansion packs added a whole ton of new features just to add to the life simulation experience. The Sims 3 store, despite being still way too overpriced, also added additional optional content. For example, the baby swing, the toddler walker, and the playpen, and even like the boardwalk roller coaster venue, or a few of my favorite premium content items. But at the end of the day, these are still optional items. You can still teach your toddler to walk without a walker. You can still, you know, put your baby in the crib without having a baby swing. You can still get up your Sims fun and have visit many other lots without having a roller coaster. So at the end of the day, like stuff was not missing from the core life simulation experience if you couldn't get these overpriced store items. However, the main element that The Sims 3 did not necessarily seem to take from Will Wright's example is the well-tested interface. It is no secret that The Sims 3 has problems with how it runs. Um, performance is probably its biggest drawback for the majority of players. This is Lindsay Pearson. She's the general manager of The Sims, speaking on the performance issues of The Sims 3. Like we knew that Sims 3 had trouble with performance, <laughs> not even sh not even five years in, like even shorter no, in, it was, got slower and slower. Yeah. Um, but computers are getting faster and faster each year, which is making The Sims 3 more playable to a degree. I realize that, that that's not the case for everyone and there's just... The Sims 3 has issues with performance in general, but maybe comparing our computers now than like five years ago, The Sims 3 is definitely becoming more playable and granted probably not with all the content installed. It can work. You just have to learn how to get it to work, but it can work. All that being said, The Sims 3 really added to the flexibility and the customization to The Sims franchise. Some people would argue The Sims 3 could had too much customization, which I honestly didn't really think of that perspective until doing this research. So I guess, you know, if that's the case and you're you're not really necessarily playing The Sims for all the things, you don't necessarily need all the color reels and all the options. The customization can be overwhelming and it's obviously laggy. <laughs> so if you prefer a game Gameplay that's a bit more structured, The Sims 3 may not be the best option for you. And that's fair. But I feel like The Sims 3 gave us a great balance of set storylines that we could play out, as well as giving us room for our own storytelling and our own game. And although not a perfect replica, in hindsight, I feel like The Sims 3 did a pretty good job reflecting a lot more of Will Wright's initial example. It maintained that heavy focus on The Sims' individual behaviors, but just gave players more personal freedom on the matter. So now let's talk about The Sims 4. 
next week. <laughs>